How does our small team create hundreds of videos a year? It's not a secret, it's a system built around the collaborative tools in DaVinci Resolve. And by the end of this video, you'll have that system too. For this to work, we need our whole team to be able to access any project at any time. Before we dive into Resolve, it's important to go through the setup that happens before we even create a Resolve project. This system only works if you put together a repeatable, consistent process. When a project goes into production, we start by assigning it a job code. It's based around a four letter acronym to signify the client, along with a four digit number to signify what job number this is. So for instance, if we call this video VAYT1037, that would signify Visual Aid YouTube as the client and job 1037. From there, the production team creates a shared drive on Google. There's a section for the production team that contains all sorts of documents they'll need, from creative briefs and scripts to call sheets and permits. Then there's a section for the post team, where we get any footage supplied by the client or from one of our overseas crew members that we can download to our server. This is also where we can upload material we need to send to someone out of house, like a 3D artist or an animator. We'll also have a footage review document where the crew fills us in on anything we need to know about what happened on the shoot, along with a folder that the final deliverables will get stored in that we can share with the client. While I'm thinking of it, this is probably a good moment to mention that my bosses are always on the lookout for talented collaborators. We have shoots all over the world that often need some local crew. And sometimes, if we're completely slammed with edits or compositing, we'll need some help with that too. If you've got a good amount of experience and a strong grasp of English, drop an email to producer at visualaidinc.com. And if the folks who make those decisions think you'll be a good fit for a project, they'll be in touch. Now, I'm not in charge of any of those decisions, by the way, so sorry, I can't help you with that. Anyway, back to what I was saying. On the media server, we've got a folder for each client and within each of those, a folder for each project with the matching job code. Then there's a folder structure that gets repeated for each project. It's been going through sort of an evolution recently and I'm sure it's gonna get tweaked again because no one's ever 100% happy. But right now, we've got a folder for our final deliverables, a folder for any documents we might need like scripts, the creative brief, that kind of thing, a folder for exports, which is where we keep the work in progress files that we're gonna to send to review, a post folder where we save DaVinci Resolve project files, along with XML files from a service we use called Reduct. It's a web-based service where we upload interviews, they get transcribed, and our more hands-on clients can highlight the sections they want us to use. Then we can collate them and export them out as an XML file that can be imported back into Resolve. Then we've got the media folder that contains all the material we're gonna use in the edit. We've got folders for production media, as in any video and audio captured on location, along with any other footage that's supplied by the client. Then there are folders for graphics, music, sound effects, stock footage, and voiceover. We're trying to keep the subfolders to a minimum, and like I said, this might change again after we work with it for a while. You should always be looking for ways to improve your workflow. So put together a folder structure that makes sense for you and those that you work with. The most important thing is that since any of our editors might need to work on a job at any time, we need to know exactly where to look for any file that we might need. Okay, now that's out of the way, we can jump into the DaVinci Resolve side of all this. As you know, Resolve works with project libraries that contain all your edits. We create a different project library for each client to keep things organized. And for the biggest clients that have got lots of projects, we create a new library for them every year because it can start to get a bit bogged down and it can take ages to back up. But of course, every different computer needs access to every one of these. So you can't use a local library for this. You have to set up a network library. This is a library hosted on one machine that all the others can connect to. While in theory you could use one of the edit machines as the host, it's best practice to have them hosted on a separate machine on the same network that never gets turned off. It doesn't have to be a supercomputer. It should be reasonably fast, but it doesn't need fast GPU processing. We literally use the cheapest Mac mini that was available at a local Best Buy. All the workstations that are gonna to connect to these network libraries need to be connected to the project server on a local network. All the network connections should be reasonably fast, preferably gigabit ethernet or faster. All of our machines along with our server are hardwired to a 10 gigabit switch. Most of the time this works automatically and you won't have to change anything. However, if you've got trouble connecting, you might need to adjust your network settings manually. The goal is to make sure every computer has its own unique IP address, but it's on the same network or subnet. The exact steps are different for Mac and Windows, and I am not an IT professional, so you might wanna search online for a guide like how to set static IP addresses on Windows or how to set a manual IP on Mac OS and try and get the most up-to-date steps for your system. Now also, one thing that's worth mentioning that gave me a heart attack a little while back Recently, I did an OS update on the Mac mini, and once it was back up and running, none of the workstations could connect to any of the libraries that were on it. It turns out when I did the update, it changed the IP address of the computer to something completely different. So as far as the other machines were concerned, it didn't actually exist. 
I switched it back to the address it was originally using and everything was fine. It's just something to keep in mind if that ever happens to you. You're going to need to install the DaVinci Resolve Project Server Program on the host machine. You can find that by going to blackmagicdesign.com slash support, selecting the DaVinci Resolve product family, and then scrolling down the left hand column until you find it. You'll want to use the one that matches the number of the Resolve install you're running. So 20 if you're on version 20, 19 if you're on 19, and so on. Run the installer, and the first time you open it, you'll be prompted to give your server a name and create an admin account, and then you can set up your first library. Once you have that done, it's going to look pretty similar to the project manager in Resolve. On the left, you'll have your list of project libraries, and if there's any projects in there, they'll show up on the right. Now, on your editing workstation, we're going to connect to the library you just created. In the project manager, you can select network on the top left. And then on the bottom, you can hit the add project library button. Switch it from create to connect and type in the name of the library you made along with the IP address of the host machine. You can create different members with different levels of permissions for each library. There's lots of information about that in the user manual, but since we're such a small team and we trust each other, we just use the same admin username and password we set up. Then hit connect and you'll have access to the library and all the projects that are in it. Set up this way, any editor can jump into any project at any time. If I'm in the middle of an edit, but a client for a different job calls with an emergency, I can message Blue or Ryland and they can jump in. If someone is already in a project, you'll see this little lock sign, which means someone else has it open. And that brings us to the most powerful part about using network libraries. You can enable multi-user collaboration. So multiple people can be working on the same project at the same time. You do this on a project by project basis. With the project open, choose file, multiple user collaboration. Now, if you look at the project manager, you'll see a badge that shows it's available for collaboration. When you open a collaborative project, you'll find some new tools to help you work with your team. Look in the bottom right corner of the screen. Next to the usual project settings and project manager buttons, you'll see two new icons, one for chat, where everyone currently in the project can send messages to each other, and one for collaboration. Clicking the collaboration button opens a list showing everyone who's currently working on the project. You'll always be at the top of the list on your machine. You can change the name that your team sees by simply typing a new one into the text field. Working with a team in DaVinci Resolve is built on a simple first come first served idea. Think of it like checking out a library book. The first person to open a bin, a timeline or a clip automatically locks it. Once something is locked, you'll see a little colored icon next to it. That means someone else is working on it. Other people on your team can still look at the locked item, but they can't make any changes. For example, if you open a timeline that another editor has locked, you can watch it, but you won't be able to move any clips around. This system is great because it stops people from accidentally writing over each other's work. To unlock an item you're working on, all you've got to do is click on something else. When you select a new bin or a different clip, Resolve automatically saves your changes and unlocks the previous item so someone else can work on it. It's worth mentioning that if you're trying to create a timeline inside a bin that somebody else has open, it will look like the timeline's being created, but nothing will actually happen. So keep that in mind. While automatic locking is great, you can take manual control when you need to. So you can keep a bin locked for yourself or look inside a bin without locking it. Sometimes you'll be working with a few different bins and you want to make sure you don't lose access to them. To do this, just right click on the bin you want to lock and choose lock bins. This bin will stay locked for you. No one else can make changes until you unlock it. Your teammates will see the icon on the bin so they'll know you've got it reserved. When you're ready to release it, just right click the bin again and choose unlock bins. What if you just want to peek inside a bin to find something, but you don't want to stop another teammate from being able to work in it? For this, you can open a bin in read only mode. Hold down the option key on a Mac or Alt on Windows and click the bin. You'll see a little eyeball icon that appears. This means you can look at everything inside, but the bin remains unlocked for anyone else on the team to use. This read only mode goes away as soon as you click on a different bin. Your work is always being saved automatically, but your project won't update with your team's changes until you say so. That's to stop your screen from constantly changing while you're trying to focus. When a teammate saves a change to a timeline, a circular refresh icon is going to pop up. Just click the refresh button whenever you're ready to see all the latest updates from your team. On the fusion and color pages, locking works on individual clips instead of the whole timeline. The rule is the same. The first person to select a clip gets a lock on it. Others will see an icon on that clip showing who's working on it. Now here's a really cool part. The locks for the fusion page and the color page are separate. That means one person can work on a clip in the fusion page at the exact same time another is grading that same clip in the color page. It allows your team to get more done faster. Sometimes you need to leave notes for your team or ask some questions. Resolve gives you a few ways to do that right inside the project. You can add a marker on the timeline or on a specific clip. Or you can use the built-in chat window for quick conversations. You'll see an orange dot on the chat icon when you have a new message. One very important thing to remember, 
Chat messages are not saved when you close a project. If you need to save an important note, use a marker or write it in the project notes instead. Now, honestly, I don't know how we would keep up the pace of edits we've got to put out every year without using all these tools. If you've got any specific questions, drop them down in the comments below and I will do my best to get you an answer. And while you're down there, don't forget to give this video a like to help other people find it and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any other DaVinci Resolve tips and tricks just like these. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.